And here's the thing for us ladies out there, men know this and they do this thing of withholding attention and then giving it because you become really easy to manipulate, right? Right. But there's all these ways that a patriarchal society has sort of conditioned us to believe men are the prize and they should be sort of like sitting back and having their pick and that women sort of wait to be chosen. And once you're chosen, that means that you are worthy because a man says so. And there was a time when like the woman was the goddess, like to be in the presence of the goddess was a gift and men were aware of that and it was like you come to the goddess with an offering and we've really lost track of that. It's Violet Benson, your favorite meme queen and the big sis you didn't ask for but need. Welcome to Almost Adulting. Almost Adulting. Almost Adulting. Are you ready? I had a sex dream the other day and the reason the sex dream is so memorable because it's unlike any sex dream I've ever had in my life. So basically I was talking to this guy who lives in New York before I was planning my trip to New York. Long story short, I decided not to progress things. So I wasn't even going to meet up with him while I was going to New York. But a day or two before I was heading to New York, I dreamt about him. And first it started pretty hot and heavy. We were rolling around somewhere, maybe in a bed, I'm not sure, but we were making out and it was hot. It was exciting. I was thinking in my dream, maybe I should call him, maybe it's meant to be. And then as we were kissing and it's getting all sweaty and we're touching each other, I decide to go and nibble on his ear because I know the men like those little kisses. So as I go and start kissing his ear and I start nibbling on it, I decide to kind of bite on it a little bit and as I go to bite on it for whatever reason my teeth will just not close I'm like oh shit I haven't been wearing my retainer for like a week now so my overbite must have come back my overbite got so big that I don't think I could even bite an apple with my teeth right now let alone nibble on the bottom of his earlobe like my mouth just will not clothes. I felt so embarrassed. I'm like, holy shit, this is so unsexy. But I'm like, no, wait, I can save this. I can save this. Maybe he doesn't even notice it. He doesn't know. Like he's already been kissing me. He doesn't care. V, he wants you. Okay. He doesn't care about your big, large horse teeth overbite. Okay. He doesn't care. He loves you. So then I decide, okay, I can save this. If I just go a little higher up on his ear, like reach to the middle of his ear, maybe able to bite onto that because there's more ear there, right? There's more cartilage or whatever it's called. So I'll just put half of his ear in my mouth until I reach the middle of his ear and I will nibble on that. I will just swirl around with my tongue. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> through the whole bottom of his ear. I don't know. You know, some people could be into it. Like, I've never done this before, but in my dream, why wouldn't he be into it? You know, we're already doing the deed. He has no complaints so far. So I start putting the rest of his ear in my mouth until I reach the middle of the ear. And I'm finally able to grab it with my teeth. And I'm like, okay, let's fucking go. You got this. So I grab on there and I nibble a little on his ear and I'm like, okay, that's enough. And then I just want to give it an amazing finale by closing my mouth and then dragging my teeth down his ear until his ear is no longer in my mouth. I have hopefully I'm giving you like a vision from what I'm trying to say with English being my third language, but you get the drill, you know, just close your eyes and try to imagine my sex story as I'm telling it. So at this point, as I'm dragging down my teeth all the way down to the end of his ear, my overbite must have been fixed in that moment because suddenly I have a new problem. His earlobe is now in my mouth. I somehow drag down with my horse teeth, (laughs) went down his ear and completely removed his lower earlobe of his ear. It's in my mouth. It's in there. I don't know why, but it's it's there. And he obviously has a fake ear. I don't know why, but it's like half of his ear is fake and it's an earlobe and it was attached and I just removed it. I'm like, oh my God, don't worry. I can barely speak because, you know, it's in my mouth. So then as I'm trying to speak to him, because he looks nervous, like he's a little freaked out. I want to tell him like, hey, it's okay. It's not a big deal. You know, we're all human. We all have flaws. Not that, you know, not having an earlobe is a flaw. Don't come for me. It's great. You know, congratulations if you don't have one. Not congratulations. Bye. So I remove the earlobe out of my mouth 
And for whatever reason, there's loads of saliva. It's just soaked in my saliva. I don't know why I'm producing so much saliva in that moment. Maybe the ear felt really delicious. Maybe it smelled like meat and I just started like salivating. Is that the correct word? I don't know. So I just grab out of my mouth and put onto the side table next to the bed. And then I look at him. I put my hand on his cheek and I go, hey, 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 buddy it's okay. It's not a big deal. It's fine. Don't worry about it. And then I go to keep kissing him. Correct. This is my sex dream. <laughs> for whatever reason, for the life of me, I could not wake up. I wish I would, but I'm not. I'm not waking up. I'm continuing the making out. Like we're kissing. We're hot and heavy. And then finally, my alarm goes off and I finally wake up. And then there I am just laying in bed, staring into space, trying to process why the F was that detail so necessary to show up in my dream? Fine, I get it, the overbite. Maybe it's because I haven't been wearing my retainer and it's my brain reminding me what could happen if I don't keep wearing my night retainer. But the earlobe being attached to the guy's ear, like why? Why was that detail there? Where in my brain, in my subconscious, in the back of my head, like where in there was that little gem hidden, waiting to come out while I'm sleeping because your brain is most active when you're sleeping. So for whatever reason, this little thing was just waiting to have its big debut in my sex dream where I am making out the an earlobe and next thing I know, it's in my mouth and it's detachable and I'm comforting the guy that it's not a big deal, it's fine. But you best believe after that dream, I definitely was no longer thinking about this guy or thinking about contacting him before I go to New York. So if I even had the slightest thought of reaching out, I definitely did not after that dream. So maybe the dream really did serve its purpose. So let me know if you have any fun sex dreams. You can DM me on Viola Benson Instagram or you can email me at press at daddyissuesla.com to tell me about your sex dreams and if they're as wild and fun like mine. And I'd love to share them on the next podcast episode. Anyway, hi besties and welcome to a brand new almost adulting the largest self-love podcast and movement. Your number one destination for personal growth, mental health, dating and everything in between. I'm your Russian big sister giving you that tough love that you may not want to hear but best believe you're gonna need did i already say my name i forgot so i'm your big sister your host and whatever you, your family violetta and welcome to a brand new episode so like i promised i've decided i'm going to do three segments on every thursday episode weekly basically i have been reading your reviews i've been reading your dms and like a recent review that i had was somebody that said sometimes my episodes feel too serious too deep and that is why i'm so excited to be doing these three segments the first segment which you already got a little bit of is just a let's catch up just shooting the shit for anyone out there that's not looking for the serious learning stuff type of episode so you'll get to enjoy this first segment then the second segment is the actual episode with my guest today, which is Danae Logan. She is a couples therapist. And then the third segment is going to be Benson Knows Best, which is basically you guys have been giving me questions every single week that I collect from you guys every Tuesday. I put a Q&A in my stories on Almost Adulting Instagram. And then based on those questions, I feature some of you on the podcast by answering whatever you want or need to hear. And lastly, I am back with my premium podcast with new episodes every Tuesday and sometimes more on the premium podcast, which is almostadulting.supercast.com. We are back. I just released two Zodiac sign episodes this past Tuesday, which is how to get a Gemini man obsessed with you and how to get a Leo man obsessed with you. So go ahead and subscribe to that podcast if you're not subscribed already. And it'll also be in the description bio of today's episode. Okay. Now, with all of that said, let's finish up today's first segment of catching up. I've already been going through all the different questions you've been asking me from Benson Knows Best. One of the questions was, what's something that most people would never guess about you? And I wanted to share it because it's actually something really funny. I would say something that most people would never guess about me. It's probably the fact that as confrontational as I come off because I just say whatever I'm thinking, I'm actually not a confrontational person in real life, especially when there's conflict in front of me. Like I'm one of those people I process in silence. I need to think about it. I need to understand how I feel. And I'm also too uncomfortable to express it. So because of that, 
because I believe myself to not be a confrontational person, I have this weird thing that I've been doing that I didn't realize I've been doing until I started thinking about it. I pretend to fake fall asleep when I have men in my home and I want them to leave. So whether I'm dating someone and we just slept together or whether I'm dating someone and we're just hanging out in my house and I realize like I don't want them to be here anymore. Instead of just telling them, hey, you should go. I don't know how to do that. So instead, I just pretend to fall asleep. No matter what I'm doing, where I'm at, I just fake sleep until they get the hint and they leave, which is so crazy saying it out loud. I really need to stop doing it, which it reminds me, two years ago, I was dating this guy and he was so nice and romantic and everything, but I don't know if it's a vaping thing because I don't vape, but he vaped a lot. And for whatever reason, after he would vape, it somehow gathered a lot of saliva in his mouth. So every time he would vape and then he would go to kiss me, I felt like I was collecting all of his saliva and he had so much of it. It was just like gallons of saliva. And I would be just struggling trying to swallow all of it without being grossed out, without wanting to throw up. And I literally wanted to kill myself every time he would kiss me. And for whatever reason, I didn't know how to break up with him. And I didn't know how to tell him about his saliva because it's just you know, it can come off mean. So instead, I was just constantly avoiding kissing him, which is actually meaner. And then the dumbest thing that I did was one day after we were in Malibu together, it must have been on 4th of July, we come back home to my house and we're cuddling on my couch. And of course, he starts kissing me and I'm like, God, I just want to die. And because I'm so not a confrontational person, I fake fall asleep mid kiss, mid kiss, mid make out, I fake fall asleep. I don't know what my thought process was through that, but I could have just been like, hey, I really want to watch this part on TV or hey, do you want some water? Hey, I'm going to go to the bathroom. Hey, can you just leave my fucking house and never come back? But no, we're making out and I fake fall asleep as if that would ever happen. And I could just feel him staring at me as my eyes are closed. <laughs> and then I kind of just turn around to the side and it keeps sleeping and he just I think was shocked and then he's purposely moving around so much you would think there was an earthquake the way he was purposely moving hoping to wake me up and I'm just still as a dead corpse not moving fake sleeping until I finally hear him whisper and he says I think I'm gonna go home literally that's what woke me up and I go and I look at him I go oh hey oh my god how long was I out for are you sure yeah <laughs> anyway, when I finally had the courage to break up with him, he told me, hey, by the way, that one day, I know you were fake sleeping. And I'm like, what? No, I think I, I have that problem where people just pass out. Like, I think I think I need to go see a doctor. Anyway, that was really embarrassing. And I, I need to work on being more confrontational. It's really hard for me. I've been working on it. Anyway, I hope you enjoy the first segment of today's episode. Without further ado, to introduce my guest today, it is Danae Logan. She is a couples therapist. She is an author. She just recently wrote a book called Sovereign Love, which is all about masculine and feminine energy. She's also a psychiatrist with an MA and an RYT. She also has her own podcast called Cheaper Than Therapy. She's brilliant and she's an expert in topics that we will be covering, which is everywhere from why casual sex is ruined your dating life. We discuss anxious attachment style, compatibility versus chemistry. Sometimes you can't tell the difference. We're going to discuss why you should never fall for potential, how to carry your feminine and masculine energy when you are dating and how it shows up in the world. We're going to be discussing the wounded masculine energy and how to heal that and just so much more. We dive into so much stuff and I'm so excited for you guys to listen. She was such an amazing guest. It's such a great episode. Enjoy. Love ya. Bye. All right, so let's dive in with my amazing guest, Danae Logan. We are now going to cover her brand new book that just came out the end of May. Mm. It's about a guide to healing relationships by reclaiming the masculine and feminine within. Yeah. So how do you experience the world through masculine energy? Share with me kind of the positives or being in your masculine energy for a woman mm. and versus what it looks like when it starts to spill over into dating. Yeah, I love that. So I think masculine ener energy to me, like at its core is the energy of confidence. It's the energy of clarity and mission and like, you know, action energy. And so in 
either one of these energetics, we can sort of be in the healthy space, which is like the qualities that I just listed, or the more distorted space, which is like the wounded energy of masculine energy, which is a lot of what our societal templates have been up to this point. So, so much of what we as women have been really conditioned to do and be in a patriarchal society is really living so much of our life in wounded masculine energy, which is like really controlling, really sort of like in dating, bridging the gap between us and a guy and he's not there but I'll get him there I'll like you know figure it out for him all of those things and so there's a lot of ways that you know our healthy masculine energy as women is really sort of being in this space of being my own fierce protector and using Mm -hmm. discernment when I'm dating and really being clear about what is a good fit for what I long for and what isn't aligned and really like being in the practice of learning to stay with ourselves and contain ourselves versus feeling like I need some external force some man, whoever, to be all of these things for me in order for me to be okay in my skin. You just mentioned wounded masculine energy. Masculine energy. Yeah. What does that mean? So the wounded masculine energy to me is like our societal template. It's like productivity at all costs, competitive, fear-driven, never feeling like we're enough, controlling, always striving. There's so much about, especially in Western culture and the way that we're raised, that is really a wounded masculine template. But we're all really conditioned to hold all of our feminine and all of us, regardless of gender, have both masculine and feminine energetics within us. But we're really conditioned to hold our feminine in general with contempt. And when we think of feminine energy, we think of more wounded feminine energy. So we think of like anxious energy and clinging and people pleasing and codependency. We think of those things as feminine energy, but they're wounded feminine energy. Right. So the wounded feminine energy that kind of becomes when you start to act like this person's mother by by sacrificing yourself and doing things like that. Is that kind of wounded feminine energy? It's sort of a yes and because here's the interesting thing about mothering energy. And this is a big one in relationships once we get into relationships. Mothering energy is actually a a masculine energetic. And anyone who's ever had a child, it's fascinating the extent to which all of a sudden you're like protect and contain and keep this kid alive. And all of this like really like, you know. That is masculine energy. It's like really masculine. And a lot of times with couples, when they have a baby, it's like a battle of the alphas because they're both like sort of figuring out who's going be the more masculine in their energetic, right? Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Because I, I think when I think of being too much in your masculine energy when you're dating, I look at it in a way where you become the guy's, the part, your partner's dad. Mm. So I guess it's it can be very similar then to the mother energy as well. Because dad or mother, regardless, is you're trying to control. You're trying right. to, I know what's good for you. Take your umbrella with you. You know it's going to rain. I told you, it's 20% chance it's going to rain outside. You're going to get sick. And then I'm going to have to take care of you. Take your umbrella and you feel like a child with totally. his partner now. And an easy way to think of it is leadership. And a lot of times we think of, you know, leadership when we think of healthy masculine energy, but when it gets into the space of distortion or sort of wounded energy, it can feel like control. So now same question for the feminine energy. Mm. How do you experience the world through feminine energy? And then what are the positives of that versus when it starts to overly spill into the world with being overly feminine, as you said, wounded feminine energy. Yeah. So our healthy feminine energetic, I always think of trust when I think of feminine energy first, because feminine energy is the energetic within us that's connected to source and to like trust in life and that things are sort of evolving and flowing as they're meant to. And when we're in healthy feminine energy, we're in that space of just allowing and play really receptive energy. If you think of like our anatomy, the masculine is sort of the giving energy, the feminine is the receiving energy. And so there's a lot of ways that like when we're in that healthy feminine energy, we have released that control and we're able to be vulnerable and, you know, sometimes a little bit messy because that's a part of the feminine energetic as well. And we're not in that sort of contained, like everything like needs to look perfect energy. We're just sort of like allowing ourselves to be a little bit more. But then when we think of what that looks like when it's more in that distorted space, it's in that space of like, I can't trust so I have to like attempt to like outsource my power and believe that I need something outside of me to be whole. And so the feminine energetic, when it's distorted, a lot of times that's when we're sort of in those codependent ways of being in relationships. Got it. So that it falls into the codependency. I don't know who I am without this person. That's right. So that you're still in your feminine energy, but now it's spilling a little too much where you're no longer trusting yourself. Yes. 
So what would you say the difference is between feminine and masculine energy when it comes to dating? Yeah, like I think a lot of times what I have seen happen, and we're in like a really interesting time in the world of dating because I think people are really, you know, it's shifting. The dating apps have really been from my perspective, like an over exaggeration of like wounded masculine energy where we're just so in the like how things look and swiping and like really sort of dehumanizing ways of like attempting to relate to one another. We're in a space where, I mean, my gosh, I work with a lot of single women and there's just a way that they're just like really over the ghosting and the feeling like, you know, I invest all this time in like talking to someone for like five weeks or something and then they're just out and I think there's a lot of we're just like needing to get back into some of like our healthy feminine and whenever I talk about like when we're in the distorted spaces of masculine energy Mm -hmm. it's always like healthy feminine that is like the the cure the antidote to that and same with when we're in wounded feminine we go up to like our healthy masculine to contain that energy but I think in terms of dating I am just like obsessed with like we all need to like step back a little bit and do a little bit of an assessment like how do we get to a space where we're just being a little bit more human with one another because it's a little bit both of the wounded paradigms if you think about it on the one hand we're just attempting to really like you know focus on what things look like versus how they really feel in our bodies which Mm -hmm. is really like a wounded masculine template but in addition to that, we're really feeling like I need someone outside of me to be whole. And so we're not using a lot of discernment in terms of like who we're choosing to be with. It's like, well, this guy is like good enough for now. And I can sort of see like how this could, you know, I could shape him into someone that I could love or like all of the situationships and sort of like the ways that we're sort of gaslighting ourselves. Yeah. Um, And not really like loving ourselves well a lot of times in some of those dynamics because they don't feel good and we're not really being honest with ourselves about the truth of how they feel and that in and of itself is also a wounded masculine template. I love that. I I definitely agree with the whole not being honest with ourselves. Mm. I think it's so often that we are not being honest with ourselves and then we end up blaming the environment or outside reasons and other people versus if we were just honest with ourselves from the beginning, we would have known that we were setting ourselves for failure or to, to get hurt and so on. I am kind of curious about the whole dating. I, I agree with you. I mean, As you were talking, I was even thinking of, for example, Bumble. The Bumble was supposed to be the whole thing about allowing women to take the first step. So they're empowering women. But really, if when you compare it to masculine and feminine energy, it actually ends up putting women in in their masculine energy because they're pursuing the man. They have to contact them first Mm -hmm. and reach out. You know, the man is the one that's allowed to kind of sit back and wait for someone to pursue him. And even situationships and things like that has allowed women to accidentally get in their masculine energy because they're like, okay, I have a roster. So I have all these guys. And like, who cares if I'm going to like just use this guy for sex and pursue this one, whatever. It's a roster and it's I'm having fun. And you're not realizing how each little action is putting you more and more in your pursuing energy. And I don't, I don't, I don't understand the point of situation shifts and all those things me personally. (laughs) I mean, absolutely. And I mean, there's just so many layers to it. When you think about what a patriarchal society has done to all of us, really, is it's sort of like distorted some of these energetics and like what feels good in our essence and in our bodies. And the masculine is the energetic that pursues. That actually does feel good um, to a core masculine man, right? But there's all these ways that a patriarchal society has sort of conditioned us to believe men are the prize and they should be sort of like sitting back and having their pick and that women sort of wait to be chosen. And once you're chosen, like, you know, that means that you are worthy because a man says so. There was Right. A- and you talk about that in your chapter, <laughs> chapter one, about being chosen. Totally. And there was a time when like the woman was the goddess. Like to be in the presence of the goddess was a gift and men were like aware of that. And it was like, you come to the goddess with an offering and we've really lost track of that. You hear men on some of these podcasts talk about the baby and switching of women that they're having sex with. And you're like, the extent to which we have gotten away from what it is to be in the presence of a goddess is staggering to me. But what's interesting about what you're saying about Bumble is, you know, there was a huge backlash to like them sort of reframing the thing around like, you know, you can't be celibate, get out here and like, 
have fun and have sex, right? Because I guess what was happening is a lot of women are just sort of less interested in dating apps than they used to be. And in South Korea right now, I don't know if you've heard about yeah, this. So you're the first movement, so you know, but it's like they're it's starting to catch on more here that women are like, this isn't actually as satisfying or fulfilling for me as I've been pretending it is for me Good, to be I'm in glad. situationships women with people are being that more don't care honest about with me. themselves. Totally. I mean, it's lit- two episodes ago, a couple of episodes ago, I literally talk about a guide of man hormones and female hormones and the difference between our mm. hormones that we produce when we're dating, when we're having sex. Yes. And it's actual science. So we can, pre- I don't, I genuinely believe that whoever decided to go along with that whole th- saying of women love sex just as much as men and we can have sex without any attachment, blah, 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 was created by a man. And then you're just afterwards, you're like, that's so weird. It doesn't make me feel good. Mm-hmm. I feel really attached. I don't know. I don't like that. But that's, we are kind of steering away from it you know (laughs) teach their own yeah and it's it's really not to bring any shame and I think this is important because actually in some ways some of that was developmentally appropriate from my perspective like if you think about the dawn of patriarchy and the fact that there was a time when women's sex and sensuality was really controlled by the church and by men and so women couldn't have any sort of like relationship with their sensuality unless it was controlled by men, unless their fathers like gave them to a man, things like that, right? Mm -hmm. And so the modern feminist movement, like a lot of like the reclamation of that was like, no, you can't tell us, like we'll have sex with whoever we want. But it's sort of like the pendulum swung so far that it was like, we will have sex with whoever we want without a lot of like just honoring of ourselves and holding our sex with a little bit of like reverence. And this is a sacred thing that that we're offering to just anyone. And that that matters. I think when people put it in perspective of just sex then I can see the whole well screw this I'm gonna sleep with whoever I want Mm -hmm. but you can still take your power back with sex and use sex to your advantage as a woman in your feminine energy and your dark feminine energy as a Scorpio in your dark (laughs) feminine energy but you use it in a way where you're actually not giving it that's right that's your power. Your power, it's not to go around and sleep with everyone because then you're it. just exchanging all this energy and you're allowing people a part of you and they don't deserve it. In my opinion, you take sex and you empower yourself by holding it to you for yourself and you kind of get to decide who to give it to. I I genuinely always say men do a lot more things for me mm. because I don't sleep with them. That's right. That's my power. I, among other things, that's obviously. Right. That's all I have to offer, but you know what I mean? No, I absolutely. think you that's how you empower yourself through sex by knowing that you get to choose whether or not you want to sleep with someone and not feeling guilty or feeling like, okay, this is how I'll keep this person around. Mm-hmm. That's my power. Like my vagina, my sex, like my body, my time. That's like my power. And I feel like there's something so feminine and sexual and beautiful about it mm-hmm. that, you know, I get to decide I who decide. I get to share with. When we're in that space of like my sex and my body and my sensuality belongs to me, it does feel like a superpower. It feels like, no, I get to decide and it is a sacred thing that I would share with anyone. And it really is when you think about that we take on people's energy and trauma in that exchange whenever we have sex with them, it actually is kind of a big deal. So you do believe that you swap energies when you're sleeping with a man? I believe we do, yes. Let me guess, babes, your Madison cabinet is crammed with stuff that just doesn't work, right? You're still not sleeping, you're still hurt, you're still stressed out. That is how it used to be for me. I had the back of an 80-year-old. So then I cleared out my cabinet and I reset my health with CBD from CV Distillery. And it's been a real game changer. CV Distillery's targeted formulations are made from the highest quality clean ingredients, no fluff, no fillers, just pure, effective CBD solutions designed to help support your health. In two non-clinical surveys, 81% of customers experienced more calm, 80% said the CBD helped with pain after physical activity, and an impressive 90% said that they even slept better with CBD, me being one of them. I take CBD from CV Distillery every single night and it helps me sleep. And then when I wake up, I don't feel groggy. I'm able to just get up and go on with my day. And before I would stay up till 2, 3 a.m. Now I'm able to go to sleep by 11, maybe 12 a.m. When for me, it's such a big difference. If you struggle with a health concern and you haven't found relief, then why not make the change like I did to CV Distillery? With over 2 million customers and a solid 100% money-back guarantee, 
CV Distillery is a source to trust. I have right now a 20% discount code to get you started. So all you need to do is visit cvdistillery.com and use my code ADULTING for 20% off. That is cvdistillery.com using my code ADULTING for 20% off. For the girlies in the back that are have some hearing problems like me, it is CV Distillery. The sun is shining, the waves are calling, and it's time for some fun in the sun. But is your hair ready for that heat? Sun, salt, and SPF can all impact your hair health. So that is why I recommend to start with Nutrafol. So now you can keep your strands feeling strong this summer. So I've spoken about Nutrafol in the past, basically when I felt like my hair was thinning and it just wasn't what it used to be. I don't know if it was caused because of stress or because I had hair extensions, whatever it was. But around a year ago, I started my process of redoing, revamping my whole hair. So not only did I take out my hair extensions and I cut my hair, but I also added in Nutrafol in order to bring my hair back to life. And I started taking four supplements supplements every single morning and I started to notice results within the first six months. Nutrafol is basically the number one dermatologist recommended hair growth supplement with over 1 million people, including myself, who have seen thicker, stronger and faster growing hair with less shedding. And look, everyone's root causes of hair thinning can be different, but it's crazy that one in two women experience some type of hair issues, including thinning, and no one really wants to talk about it. So that is why I wanted to endorse this and really talk about it. Like everyone's root causes of hair thinning are different. So a one size fit all approach to hair growth doesn't always cut it. Nutrafol has multiple formulas that are tailored to give you specifically in your hair what is needed to grow throughout different stages of your life, whether it's postpartum, menopause, just life stresses, as well as different lifestyles such as planet-based diets and so on. With Nutrafol, building a hair growth routine is so simple. All you have to do is purchase online. There's no prescription required. It's free shipping and it's automated deliveries. And sure, you will never miss a day. And again, you see results in around three to six months. Not only did I see results in my hair, but I noticed that my lashes got thicker. My eyebrows got thicker. I even started sleeping better, which was so random. I don't understand it, but I'm into it. So get the results that you can run your fingers through. For a limited time right now, Nutrafol is offering my listeners $10 off of your first month subscription and free shipping when you go to Nutrafol.com and enter my promo code ADULTING. So find out why over 4,500 healthcare professionals and stylists recommend Nutrafol for healthier hair. It's Nutrafol.com spelled N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L.com using my promo code ADULTING. Once again, that is Nutrafol.com with my promo code ADULTING. Have beautiful hair this summer. I think that... It is a sacred energy exchange. And there's a reason why when we are transmuting energy between two people. And so there's a reason why it can feel really difficult to cut cords with people that we know. Like, I just like this person is awful for me. It doesn't even feel good to be around them. But we've taken in a lot of their pain and a lot of their hurts. And that is living within us. And so we feel this attachment a lot of times. I believe that is the energy that is exchanged between two people. And I, I don't actually think casual sex is a thing in the th- in the way that we think that it is, but I think we're just now starting to understand energetics a lot more than we used to. So we're starting to like, you know, we're moving from, from my perspective, this five sensory consciousness of being human, which is, you know, we're only aware of what we can see, touch, taste, smell, and hear, to multi-sensory consciousness, where we're aware of energetics and our intuition and synchronicities and all of these subtle levels of consciousness, right? And so a part of that is other people's energy. And I heard you talking about this in an episode before I came where you were talking about there's a reason that when you pull your energy back, someone feels that. We are energetic beings. We feel one another. It's just facts. These laws of the universe are like the laws of gravity. And when you all of a sudden, you pull your energy back from someone that you've been obsessed with, they feel the difference. And all of a sudden they call you. How, why does that happen? It's because we're energetic beings and we're connected to one another. But if someone has a lot of trauma and pain moving through their body and you have sex with them, you start to take on that energy and you start to feel some of that that's not yours to carry through that transmission. It's just, it is a thing. And that 
that's probably when you a lot of times you end up losing yourself and another person and mm. you don't know where your feelings start and their feelings end right. because it's so mixed so if you I think that's another reason for other for women out there to really take into consideration when who they're sleeping with mm. because it's literally going inside of us that's right like it's full on that's putting, right putting their energy inside of us. and I think I read before that it takes around seven years to completely remove a person's mm. body and everything and energy and everything from from us, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's like a- to shed it completely. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, when you start to understand it that way, you're literally like, no wonder. <laughs> like it's all of these things that you've been carrying that from our rational mind, we're like, that doesn't even make sense. Like, I'm not even like really attracted to who this person is, the way they show up in the world. They're kind of, you know, I don't admire them. And yet I can't let go of this. And a lot of times it's because we've created these attachments. Yeah. So then what practical steps can women take to kind of tap into their feminine energy Mm. in dating? If they're currently a bit in their masculine energy or they're just confused, they can't even tell which energy they're in. You know, I think what I talk about a lot in the book is that I think our work is to really integrate our own energy first before we get into the focus of the external. Like if it were up to me, I'd be like, we'd all take a giant pause, (laughs) like step back and really do some of this inner work to like get curious about what's driving all of my motivations with these things, right? And so a lot of times when we realize that we've been living so much in this wounded masculine way of being and just like striving and showing up in the world that way, our work is to really go back for the little girl within us and just say like, what did she love to do before the world told her who to be, before she was pleasing, before she felt like her body and all of the things needed to be a certain way in order for her to be enough and just start to get back in relationship with her and like following the breadcrumbs of your own bliss and the things that you love to do. And I think when we get into that space of being reacquainted with ourselves, it's just like a process of slowing down and being. And from there, you know, because the feminine always goes first in terms of the internal space. Like we go inward and we get curious and we start to be in relationship with ourselves. And from there we move into inspired action. And then it's like, okay, what action do I want to take from my healthy masculine? to be in the world. What does that look like? What do I want to do with this newfound sense of self that I'm cultivating? But we've got to give ourselves a little bit of time to go back for that inner little girl first and really like be protective of her, you know, but we can't really do that until we get to know her well again. Right. So I guess that really does have to do with just taking your energy back Mm -hmm. and focusing on yourself. So which goes intertwines with then allowing things to come to you and allowing yourself to just receive. That's such a big one though, what you just said, because what I see most in dating is there's such a like, I got to figure this out. I got to make this happen. I don't want to be alone. So I'm going to get in there. Right. And I think I believe actually we are moving into a space where we are just allowing a lot more and that there's a lot less that we have to do. And this is a little bit of the antithesis of the dating app sphere, but, and even that. Like, I think if you're going to be on dating apps, how do I just be open to meeting people without an agenda that like, how do I get to know this other soul sitting in front of me for who they are without feeling like, is this my husband or not? (laughs) Like, can I just be present with another person? But I think there's all of these ways that if we believe that there is a divine unfolding to all of this, if I'm just living my life and doing the things that I love, I promise the people that you are meant to collide with will find you. But we can't be in the energy to receive that if we're just in this like wounded masculine armor of like, I got to tackle and make it happen and figure it out. Um, We're really not in the receptive mode to like have any of that come to us. I feel like one thing that really confuses me about the different conversations that I hear people having because one is being your feminine energy allow things to come to you you know you focus on yourself and what's meant to be will be and I love that but then the other side when it comes to dating well dating is work just like everything else you do in your life that you have to put in the work you have to put in the work in dating you have to go out there you have to put yourself out there you have to leave your house you have to get on dating apps you have to so then I'm like okay that sounds like Mm. two separate conversations so I'm confused do I just allow things to come to me or do I actually also have to put in the work and I have to get to know people? I have to talk to different people. I have to ask around to let people know of my intentions. So like, which one is it? Or is it kind of, there's a median in between where that's where you mix the masculine and feminine energy together? Yeah. 
Well, to me, in every moment, we are either choosing between fear or love. And the Mm -hmm. ego, which is the wounded masculine template, is the energetic of fear. And that's a lot of what our societal template has been rooted in. The soul, which is the healthy feminine template, is the energy of love. Now, I believe that, you know, if you think about the energy of like, you have to get out there, it's got to be work. Like, <laughs> you're not going to find your person. Like, I feel a little bit anxious. <laughs> like that, right? Like, yeah. that is the energetic of fear. The trusting energetic of love would say, if you are living your life, if you do the things that you enjoy, if you stay rooted in the truth of who you are in this world, what is meant for you will never miss you. I heard you say that in that episode as well. Like, I love that quote. Fundamental truth. Like that is what is true of this life. But that's like believing that there's a divine unfolding to all of this. And you're right. It is the antithesis of everything we're taught about love and relationships. But I find as someone who works primarily with couples, that way of approaching love and relationships does not come without an outcome and a cost on the other side of it, right? Because we're still in that space of controlling and making things happen happen Mm -hmm. and all of those things once we're in relationship with that person and it just doesn't really feel fulfilling you know Hmm. so then when you are getting into these relationships because you in chapter two you discuss the energy shift Mm -hmm. between the sexes and how you have this theory that something shifts within the human psyche the moment we enter into relationship and commit and you were just mentioning that that you can suddenly switch the control then two questions one what do you mean when you say (laughs) what what What? do you mean when you say there's an energy shift when you finally enter the relationship and commit and then two How can you be then self-aware to pay attention to this energy switch versus blaming your partner for not being who you think they are or for not, you know, being on the same page as you and Mm. so on? Okay. A lot of what I get into in the book is that we have been raised with an ownership template in relationships. And what that means is once you are mine, my girlfriend, my partner, my whatever, I own you basically. Period. I'm kidding. (laughs) No. (laughs) <laughs> and that in and of itself it's like it it sounds kind of like nice in theory it's like you belong to me it's yeah, kind of yeah. a romantic sentiment but the actual felt experience of that leads to a lot of like think about the things you own right in the beginning you love them they're amazing you're like super excited about them and then you barely notice them and then you're sort of like take them for granted and it leads to a lot of complacency in relationships so what ends up happening between men and women in relationships is in the beginning he He's pursuing you. He's the hunter. He wants you. He's like, you know, all the swag, trying to make it happen, all of those things. And then once you're his, it's like, what do you want to eat? Where do you want to go? I don't care. Whatever, right? Like, he's not trying to woo you. But the feminine is aroused in being seen and discovered. And so when she is not feeling that anymore, all of a sudden, all of the life force, all of the Raja and things that we long to feel as women, we don't feel that anymore. And we start to feel really resentful. And then we start to go into that wounded masculine template of like telling them how to get back in line with who we want them to be. And a lot of times men end up in sort of like a really wounded feminine energetic, like happy wife, happy life. That's an expression that is very like you lead, just tell me what to do and I'll do it. Right. Um, And so we've sort of created these distortions that are leading to a real lack of fulfillment. Now, I really attempt to support couples in saying your person doesn't belong to you ever. Mm -hmm. And if you hold that as like the mantra or the framework that you want to bring to this relational dynamic, then it's like we're in the constant space of discovery forever and that this relationship isn't promised. This person isn't promised to me. And so how do I be really present with this as a gift that I have right now, but I might not have tomorrow? And hopefully it just brings a different level of reverence for what it is to have someone to love in my life because, you know, not everybody has that. And I think that it is actually a gift to have someone to share your life with and to love. But there's so much of our societal templates that have taught us, no, like that's the baseline. Like you should just like have the expectation that you should have that. But if we thought of it as like, no, like this is another soul who came here to carry out their soul's mission for this lifetime. How do I meet them with a real reverence and acknowledgement of that in our day-to-day interactions. Actually, something really cool yesterday, I was having a conversation with my friend Mm -hmm. and I was asking her how, 
how do you know when you love someone? Because mm. a lot of times I'm more in my head than I am in my heart. Yeah. And I've been researching what love is for years now. And instead of, you know, trying to feel it, because I want to really, I want to understand, like, I want to know what does it mean? Yeah. And she said something that I thought was really interesting. I've always hear people when I talk about how do you know you love this person? And they always say, because how they make me feel, how I, mm. how I am when I'm around them, how I see myself through their eyes when I'm around them. And I've always heard that. And that always confused me because when you say that, that that means if it's based on how someone makes you feel, then tomorrow I can be annoyed with them. So tomorrow <laughs> I don't love them. I don't feel that feeling. And that's what's always confused me. But then yesterday was the first time that I heard someone and she said, I like who they are. That's right. Like I love their character. Like I love who they are as a person. I'm so inspired by them constantly. And I thought that was a really completely different perspective that I don't know, for some reason, I've never, I've never seen it like that. Because when you love who someone is as a person, you keep loving them mm -hmm. as they keep growing. When you love someone who, as a person, you keep being curious about them. Yes. And your love doesn't change for them if tomorrow they're not giving you as much attention or they're annoying you because you love who they are as a person. So that means you love their good sides and their flaws as well. That's right. Yeah, I love that. And I love what your friend said. And to me, that is the differentiation between what I think is sort of like an adolescent idea of love and mature love, right? Mm -hmm. I think that when we are young, love is like, I am discovered and like someone makes me feel all kinds of like dopamine and feel good chemicals. And I love them because of that, right? And that actually has nothing to do with them. We're really conditioned to believe that love is about what I get and what someone gives me and how someone fills me up. And I I don't think that's love. I think love is about who you are and the way that you show up in this world inspires me so much that I want to rise to be the best version of myself mm. in your presence that I can possibly be. But I want to pour into you because I love you and who you are. But the other thing you said that I think is important in terms of longevity, it's interesting because I'm a couples therapist, but I don't actually put a ton of weight and emphasis on longevity, meaning, you know, that there's this thing that we just like have really been conditioned to think if people have had a long relationship, we should celebrate that, right? Like you go to a wedding and it's like, you know, the people that have been married the longest, like you be the last to sit down and then we clap for the people that have been married for like 40 years, but we have no idea what their relationship has been like. And I often say to couples, if you're with one person for a lifetime, you will be with four to five different people, even with the same person, because we are meant to evolve and shift and grow and sometimes the people that we are growing into, it's not aligned, but I don't actually hold that it is a failure or that in any way, shape or form, the love was not real when two people have a relationship that has, you know, been thriving at one point or was right for one season of their life. And it's no longer the case. But I think to me, loving you means your soul is safe with me. And mm -hmm. I want what is best for you, even if that means that we're meant to part ways and our journeys need to go in different directions. I love you. So I want that for you. But that again, circling back to what your friend said, that's love that I have for you that is about you, not about what makes me most comfortable. Right. Because you you've di you discussed in your book, transactional mm -hmm. love. And I yeah. would say that's in a sense, transactional love when it's how you make me feel where you can do for me mm -hmm. is I love you as long as you can make me feel good. That Yeah. And what I realized when I was sitting with couples Violetta, because <laughs> I love it, was that there's this way that we're competing for energy in our relationships. And we're just believing if I can get another person to fill me up energetically, then I'll be whole. But what mm -hmm. ends up happening is if I need another person to fill me up, it's like I have a cup with a hole in the bottom. And as much as they're like filling me up, it just keeps streaming out. And I used to work in addiction recovery before I became a couples therapist. And it's so fascinating how similar the cycles of addiction are to the way that we're showing up in our relationships relationship dynamics. And it's like, I want to hit somebody making me feel good. And then I feel depleted and I need it again. Right. But we're not sort of learning how to source that from within ourselves. So we're really feeling depleted by our relationships all the time and making this other person to blame for it when mm. in reality, no other person could conceivably have the capacity to give us those things. But also I believe it's our like life's work to learn how to do that for ourselves. So can you then discuss the psychological effects of codependency and then how it will then hinder personal growth within mm -hmm. a relationship? Yeah. So codependency and the reason that I say codependency to me is like the most culturally acceptable drug of choice of them all is 
Codependency is basically how we self-regulate, like we regulate our nervous system through our relationship with another person. The trouble with that is other people are the variable that are really difficult to control. They don't often want to comply, right? So it's like we're in this constant state of angst and anxiety and just do what I need you to do and comply. And, you know, there's a part of us that all of us want to be loved unconditionally for who we are. Mm. So when we're attempting to control our partner or get another person to change so that we can feel calm in our skin, what ends up happening is that person will inevitably resist because the part of them that felt criticized by a parent or wanted to be loved unconditionally, you're sort of activating that in them when you ask them to be different for you. And so they will resist it. They will not want to do that. And we will be in these cycles of struggle forever. But if I need you to be anything other than who you are for me to be okay, you hold a tremendous amount of power over me. And so I believe in order to sort of heal these codependent patterns, our work is really to do some of this integrative work that I talk about in the book that, you know, we are meant to be in relationship with one another, but I don't believe that we are meant to need one another in that way in order to feel safe in our skin. And so it's a lot of the work of like, how do I be, yes, this, you know, this solid foundation for myself and in relationship with something larger that gives me a little bit of an ability to feel safe in my skin, but also just knowing that there are some aspects of life that will always be out of our control. And how do we learn to tolerate that a little bit more than we've been able to? Right. So it's, I don't get to tell you how to love me. I just get to decide if I want to participate in the way that you love. Girl, that's Ayanna Van Zandt. I got to give her a shout out on that. And I remember I heard that quote years ago, her saying it on her show, like, fix my life. And I was like, "Ooh, that is so good. And what's fascinating about that as a couples therapist and people either like love that quote or they get super activated yeah. by it. But the thing is, Nobody changes because someone talks them into it. It's just like facts. Like we all change when we are ready from an internally motivated place. And so much of the time, our attempts to change other people or get them to be who we feel like we need them to be are one, really a way that we're distracting ourselves from our own existential anxiety and the things that we feel afraid of. But also it's a way that our inner child is sort of in a space of like repetition compulsion. And it's like whoever the person is that we're trying to get to change. So if we think of like dating or relationships, it's normally they remind us of someone that couldn't love us in the way that we longed for them to love us. And so it's like that thing of if it's hysterical, it's historical. Like there's something (laughs) here that feels familiar, which is why it's making me feel so activated. And our inner child is saying, if I can just get them to love me. Yeah, why am I not good enough for you to love me the way I need you to love me? Why am I not good enough for you to change that's right am I not worth it enough for you to change a little bit for me and I think that is how we then turn it from the person onto back onto ourselves and I agree with you we don't realize that has to do with our nervous system being Mm. dysregulated and our child wounds and all of that and we make it all about this other person like if this person will change then I will be worthy then I'll be enough and if this person right now they're telling me that I'm not enough like Mm. I'm not good enough because they won't change for me so this is validating everything I've ever felt my whole life because of you because you won't change that becomes such a mountain and how can you ever then feel comfortable enough to be in this relationship or ever trust yourself where you think like as long as this person won't change or love me the way I need them to love me, I will never be good enough in this world. That's right. And on a soul level, I believe that's sort of the assignment. Like I believe that all of our relationships are sacred collisions. I don't think anybody is sent to us by accident. Yeah. But there's this Peter Crone quote I love where he says, life will present you with the people and circumstances to show you where you're not free. And that person is like, that's sort of their divine assignment is to not comply with what you're asking them to do so that you can free yourself from the belief belief that I need anyone outside of me in order to be whole. Like they can't give that to you because on a soul level, they're not supposed to, you know, support you in becoming who you're meant to become. So when we hold it that way, it's not personal. (laughs) It's, It's like the vibration of who we are meant to become coming to fruition. 
And I think people, my, my therapist one time said a quote that I really loved. And he talked about how mm -hmm. people think that the hardest thing about dating is finding someone. When in reality, the hardest thing about dating is knowing when to leave. <laughs> and I completely wholeheartedly agree with that because we just think if I just try a little harder mm -hmm. then I can finally reach them or get to them and and that's the hardest part I mean I was in an eight-year relationship and it wasn't until I finally learned how to love myself that I start started loving my partner less and less and less and when I was able to walk away but it took me eight years too long I don't hold it against myself or against my partner I think we were both doing what we needed to heal each other in That's our right. own way but I'm so happy that I was able to kind of close the door in that but it mm. wasn't until I finally came to the conclusion that I don't need another year to to convince him to love me like he will never love me though I need him to love me and like I I will never be good enough for him in my head because I actually don't need that anymore like I can be good enough for myself I'll figure that out mm -hmm. well for me daddy issues really helped me with that so I created a new obsession I love it. <laughs> so that really helped me but I think that's the hardest part what I often say is like there could be 50 55 people in a room that are desperate to be present with you and show up for you and love you well. And a lot of times until we get into that space of doing that shadow work and understanding those core wounds, we will be drawn to the one person in that room who is like unable to show up and right. be present with yeah, us. Yeah, because this time it'll be different. <laughs> That's right. Today's episode is brought to you by No CD. Do you ever have relationship doubts that make you feel just overwhelmed that no matter what you try, you just can't seem to work through them? Maybe you're constantly asking your partner for reassurance or you're trying to assure yourself that everything is okay. Maybe nothing is okay. But then the distressing questions about your compatibility, your connection, your attraction to each other, they just won't go away. Well, did you know that this could be a type of OCD known as relationship OCD or R OCD. You might be thinking, well, that doesn't sound like OCD. Well, that's a common misconception, but no CD is here to share the truth about OCD and help people like you who are currently struggling. We often accept that these behaviors such as things like, well, it happens to everyone, or we brush them off like, oh, I'm just overthinking. I'm just an overthinker, but maybe you're not. Maybe we shouldn't. Our OCD is serious, and the good news is that it is also highly treatable. Our OCD requires specialized treatment because traditional talk therapy often will not work for OCD. And with no CD, getting that specialized treatment is easier now than ever. No CD provides effective, affordable, and convenient virtual OCD therapy that can help you feel more secure in your relationship and can help in other areas of your life too. With No CD, you can do live, you can do face to face video sessions with a licensed therapist trained in exposure and response prevention therapy. It's the most effective OCD treatment out there. No CD also accepts many major insurer plans to make your treatment more affordable. So, No CD wants to make sure that you are supported between therapy sessions when it matters the most. So you will also have access to 24-7 therapist messaging, OCD therapy tools, peer communities, and more, all in their No CD app. To learn more about therapy with No CD, all you have to do is go to nocd.com and schedule a free 15-minute call with their team. That is nocd.com to learn more and book a free 15-minute call. Take care of your relationship and yourself. So I love how you said before that falling in love with the other person's potential mm -hmm. is one of the most pervasive practices of self-abandonment. And I think that's such a good way to view it. I mean, I've never viewed it that way. So do you mind kind of elaborating why you consider it self-abandonment? Yeah, this is another one of those places where we as women especially got to take a real hard look at ourselves and take some personal responsibility because what I find ends up happening is first of all, the feminine is the energetic of expansion and like ever evolving energy that keeps growing, right? So we see where things could go. We see who you could be and that's beautiful. However, when we're in relationship with a core masculine man, the masculine is like the fixed, the stable, the like, as long as it ain't broke, don't fix it. Problem solution, right? So a lot of times when we're like falling in love with someone, 
and we're seeing the potential of who they could be, they're not necessarily interested in that. And it's really Mm. important because when we get in relationships with people later on, if we fall in love with potential, then we end up feeling really shortchanged by who this person is if they're unwilling to evolve, which most of us, again, don't really change a lot until it comes from an internally motivated place. And so, you know, what I find ends up happening is so often couples will come in to see me and the woman will have like a laundry list of things that he is not doing and the way he's not showing up and the way he can't be emotionally available and present and, you know, really see her and meet her. And I'm like, so tell me when this started. Is this like just couple weeks ago, he started acting this way. And she's like, no, he's always been this way. I just thought he would get it. I just thought he would change and evolve. And, you know, that's on me. That's for me to really take responsibility for because, you know, he had no interest in being this person that you saw him being necessarily when you saw all of this potential in him. But we sort of see people as like projects a lot of times. And again, I don't know that that's fully honoring that other soul in terms of who they want to be for themselves in this lifetime. That's back to that ownership template. Yeah, because if you really think about it, it really becomes unfair to the other person Mm. as well because they're in a relationship with someone that's not even seeing them. They don't love them for them. They love them for their potential. And I'm sure that can be just as painful without expressing it the same way. That's right. What role does self-awareness play in healing relationship patterns and then improving mental health? You know, to me, I come from just like, a way of approaching relationships in life in general that like buck stops with me on everything. Like I feel like the only person that we get to control in this life is ourselves. And so if that's the case, I don't believe that we need anyone else in this world to be anything other than exactly who they are for us to decide who we're going to be. And that's the self-awareness piece. And you were just speaking to it beautifully. It's like, if I am really activated, struggling with how this person is showing up, why? Right? Like, Mm. why is it so hard for me? What is the story I'm telling myself about what it means about my self worth, about my, you know, my ability to be lovable, whatever the thing is that I'm telling myself? It's always a story that we're telling ourselves that is creating the suffering. And it's almost always arguable. And most of the time, people are in their own pain points and their own stories of unworthiness. And that is actually why they're showing up the way that they are. And if we can sort of say, like, none of this is actually personal, but it's my work to be in relationship relationship with myself and why this feels so difficult for me to tolerate, it just feels like a superpower. It's the most empowering thing in the world because all of a sudden it's like, Everybody gets to be who they are. I just get to decide, again, how I'm going to be in relationship with them. Yeah, and how I get to show up and if I want them in my life and so on. I like that. And I do think a lot of things would be much easier for people in general, for themselves, Mm. if they look the things in a sense where humans are complicated just as much as I'm complicated, so is the person standing in front of me. And it's not always personal. I genuinely think most humans are innately good. And I think the problem is when people constantly are seeking to be understood and yet Mm. they just deny others. Oof, that part. Right? There's this thing in psychology called fundamental attribution error where it's like, if I'm late, it's because I hit five red lights. My <laughs> boss wouldn't let me out. Like all of these things. But if you're late, you're an inconsiderate person. You don't respect like, my time, right? Like that's like that's the why. When it's somebody else, but it's like you said, we're all complicated. It is complicated being a human animal. But a lot of times, we're just so stuck in our story and what this is hurting within me that I'm not really empathizing with how this is feeling for you. Because people think if they give the other person grace, and it means that their feelings will no longer be valid. And mm. I think they have to understand that my emotions can still be valid. It can still be hurt, but can I also understand that it wasn't personal. And I can also try to understand why this person did what they did. And I think when you walk through life, when you kind of have an idea where what people are doing to me has more to do with them than me. It's not personal. You kind of walk through life a little easier. And it's so nice to just, just, you know, not worry about every single look that someone gives you and the way, the tone that someone had. And it's, it's, I I can't even imagine going through life like that. It just feels so exhausting in my opinion. (laughs) Exactly. It really is. And, you know, you can never really know what like, what people are thinking about you. It's none of your business anyway. Wait, people always try to guess. I know they did that because they're mad at me for this and this and this. 
And you're like, no, you don't. You don't know. You actually don't know what they're thinking. In the same way when they were saying, I know this person's thinking about me. That's why I keep obsessing over them. Like, I know they're missing me, blah, blah, blah. You don't. It's a story you just made up in your head to make yourself feel okay. But it's not actually happening. You don't actually know that. And the thing is, it doesn't feel good, though. No. Like, think about how you feel when you think, Anxious. this person is out to get me. <laughs> they want the worst for me. Like, that feels awful. And I think so much of our work is caring more about how we feel yeah. than being right right? Like we want to be right. And we want to be in that righteous state of like, I know I'm correct, but it's like, but if it feels awful, like what's the payoff? Exactly. Can you kind of explain to me the difference between chemistry versus compatibility and how Mm. we can tell the difference? Yeah. You know, I think it's interesting because we want to have that charge. We want to have that spark. But a lot of times what we have made chemistry is some of the stuff that's like just the like the familiar a lot of times and that sort of goes back to what I was saying about like if it's hysterical it's historical it's like the chemistry can be the like dopamine surge and these Mm -hmm. highs and lows and what I see a lot of times in our relationship dynamics is like you know the guy who's breadcrumbing me finally texts me and it's like oh (laughs) it's it's amazing chemistry between us it's like yeah because you were in a really low state You got a surge of dopamine and then you have sex and it's all of these chemical interactions happening that actually have nothing to do with what's happening between you and this person. Like it's literally like, you know, the way that they do those experiments on mice. And when you take away like the feel good things, there will be a response to that when you finally get it back. Right. So and here's the thing for us ladies out there, men know this and they do this thing of withholding attention and then giving it because you become really easy to manipulate right right they take away 100 then they finally give back 90 and then they take away the 90 they give back 70 because then you accept the 70 and so on it's the whole method or something and that's it in the end by like the three month mark when they're giving you a little like on your instagram it's like he does love me i knew he He loves me the other 1500 women he's following exactly and so it's like we're you know in a lot of ways playing into that manipulation now I started realizing when I worked with couples after a while, I was like, we have intimacy with like no intimacy. Like all of these people are sleeping next to this person that they barely, oh, I couldn't say that to my husband. Like he would be hurt. And it's like, yeah, but you feel that and you're interacting with him with all of this resentment every single day. Jeez. Talk to him about it, right? But it starts when we're dating. It's like, I don't like that you go five days without texting me and then you text me and then we have sex, right? And we don't say that, but if we said that, we would probably be able to ascertain if we are actually compatible and if this is an aligned relationship. But until is we that start- a relationship? But, but, <laughs> well, we're feeling like it's a relationship. It's a situationship, whatever, right? But a lot of times it's like, oh, there's amazing chemistry but it's not actually based on someone that we are aligned or compatible with really because we're not actually having real conversations about what we're really feeling but in order to do that we have to be willing to stay with ourselves and feel worthy of having those conversations and being with someone who is able to stay with me in you know the difficult conversations and that is what it is to sort of bring our inner adult and our fierce protector to these dating dynamics I love everything you said and I think the the important thing to look into everything that you shared and with this book that it allows people to you know move the energy back into themselves and Mm -hmm. I think when you learn how to move the energy back towards yourself and to love yourself better you would be able to love other people better that's and I right. think that's the most important part because a lot of times when you, we're having these conversations it seems as if we're saying men are this and then women you need to be this goddess whatever it is but you really can love somebody to a full capacity mm-hmm. and only when you learn how to love yourself to the fullest capacity that's right right absolutely and I love that you said that because I think I want to be so clear this is not in any way shape or form right. an anti-relationship book or an anti-male book and I, I think together. I together yes I talk so much about like the love for the masculine but I think like when we love men and the masculine well we use discernment with who we choose to partner with so that we can love them well and just like really like cherish our partners and that's important exactly so where can people find your book you can find it anywhere books are sold my my website is DanaeLogan.com. You can get it there, but yeah. Really Great. And thoughts. I will link it in today's bio along with information about her so you can find her socials and her book and everything else about her. She gives amazing advice also on her own podcast mm. and on her Instagram. So I'll link all of that. Thank you so much. This is just really lovely to get to sit with you. Aww. 
Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you guys so much for listening. Now that we finished the second segment, we are going into the third segment, which is Vents and Knows Best. Since today's episode was kind of long, I'm going to keep today's segment super short. I just kind of want you to get used to the three segments which is why I'm still including it in today. So going through some of your questions that you shared with me on Tuesday when I posted in my stories, the Q&A where you ask me anything. So starting with Alexandra, she said, what to do when dating a manipulative man? Well, babes, how about sub dating him? <laughs> like, why do you guys sometimes reach out to me and ask me questions on like, basically what to do when I'm dating a guy that I don't actually like who he is as a person? Stop dating his potential. That's A, see him for who he is. B, C, let me say this again when I've said it before in a different episode. Who are you to try to change him? Did he shit himself or something? Because that's the only thing you will be able to change about him is his diapers because you can't change who he is as a person. So there's no reward in dating a manipulative man and trying to one up him. All it's going to do is make you miserable. Like, I don't understand if you think the guy you're dating is manipulative. That's not a good start to the relationship. Don't surround yourself with people who make you feel like you're crazy, like you're not good enough, like you have to fight for them. If you are staying with a man who's manipulative, after a while, he's no longer the bad guy. Like if you know who he is and you're sticking around, then you have to figure out what it is about you that's making you still want to be there. Okay, I hope that helps. Alisa asked me how to move on from the guilt of your own mistakes, how to have compassion for yourself. It's so hard, you know, one of the worst emotions that I think I genuinely believe that we experience is the emotion of guilt. It's just so debilitating. And there's literally nothing we can do because we can't go and revisit the past. We can't change it. So we just end up being stuck with this emotion of shame, of guilt, and it paralyzes you. I mean, it makes you feel helpless. So the best way you can move on from the guilt is to accept the fact that it happened, accept the fact that you're now self-aware to know that maybe you could have done something differently, but now you know better to accept the fact that you're only human and you make mistakes and you have to give yourself compassion. You have to talk to yourself the same way you would speak to your best friend. You wouldn't go to your best friend and tell her that she's an idiot, that she's stupid, that she fucked up and things will never get better because it's not true. No one's perfect. Everyone messes up whether they want to admit it or not. The fact that you're aware enough to know that you made a mistake in the past already shows growth in yourself. You will never be able to move on in your life unless you first have some compassion, forgive yourself. And if you don't have any best friends, then think about it as speaking to your younger self. Imagine telling your 10 year old self that when she broke some glass or accidentally broke her foot or pissed off her parents, that it is her mistake and she's so wrong for the mistake and it will never be okay again. Like she messed up so badly and she's a terrible person and she should just give up now. Like imagine saying that to your 10 year old self, like you would never. So it's the same thing with our mistakes. I don't know what you're currently grieving, but just know that with time, it won't seem as big of a deal. And the best way to really forgive yourself and give yourself compassion is to also share your guilt with someone else because a lot of times we hold it in because we're so ashamed. And when you hold in to the pain, to the guilt, it goes from a little road bump to suddenly feeling like a mountain and it just grows bigger and bigger inside of your heart to the point that it becomes so heavy to carry. And sometimes when you just share with someone, when you hear your words out loud, not only do you release it, so it's no longer your dirty little secret, but you're able to hear your own words and you'll be able to see like, oh, okay, it's not that big of a deal. And a friend or a loved one will be able to tell you, hey, it's okay, you're gonna be okay forgive yourself. So I hope that advice kind of helps. Maj asked, what to do when you're always liked, but never pursued by a man? Is there something wrong with me? I want you to know right now that there is nothing wrong with you. Okay. Nothing is wrong with you. Sometimes men will love the idea of you, but not the idea of actually investing any time in you. So that means that in the beginning, when it seems like he's really into you and then out of nowhere, he pulls away, whether it's after a week, after two weeks, even after a month. Unfortunately, the truth is, it means that they never fully were that invested into liking you anyway, because interest in the beginning only peaks. 
not the opposite. So normally they just want some attention. They were just entertaining it. And you can't blame yourself. There's nothing wrong with you. But I will say, if you're noticing a pattern of you constantly dating people who make you feel this way, make you feel like you are not enough, make you feel like for whatever reason in the beginning, they're so into you and then just not enough to pursue it. There's a reason for it. And it has less to do with these people that you're dating over and over again. The feeling that you are feeling is telling you information. Every time you go for a guy that's wrong for you, you're attracting the same person and it's making you feel like you're not good enough. It's information telling you that there's something in your past, in your heart, a wound that you have that you haven't healed. And you keep chasing these same type of people that keep validating a feeling you feel deep down inside. So until you figure out what's in you that's making you choose partners who are validating these, this emotion that you feel about yourself, you will keep dating these same people over and over again. No one that you will ever meet will make you feel good enough about yourself until you start doing it for yourself first. And that means that even if one day you will end up dating someone who validates how amazing you are, how beautiful you are, makes you finally feel good about yourself and sticks around, if you don't heal the part of yourself, eventually the way you talk to yourself and the way you treat yourself, it will rub off on the partner that you found. And that partner who saw you like you were the most beautiful thing in the world and wants to stick around will eventually start to view you through your eyes the same way you view yourself. That is why loving yourself is so important. I don't mean loving yourself like I'm so obsessed with how I look every single day. That's so unrealistic. And I don't mean loving yourself every single day. That's also unrealistic. I'm talking about having this confidence where you know you will always be okay because up until right now, you have been okay. So that means if someone enters your life and then chooses to leave, you know you're going to be okay. You will survive this too because what's meant for you will never lose you. I hope that helps. Somebody asked me, I love my boyfriend so much, but I feel like I'm losing my youth by being in such a long relationship. We've been together for two years. I'm only 25 and I feel like I'm not a relationship girly, but I love him so much. I don't know if I should stay true to myself. I feel like meeting new people still sometimes. I think it's the right person, wrong time. It's just so hard for me. Please help me, big sis. I hear you. Listen, as much as sometimes we feel bad to break up with someone and we feel bad about leaving, just think about the fact that what would you do if you were in a relationship with someone that didn't actually want to be there, that was constantly thinking about searching for something else? I mean, look, it's so common for us to wonder, is the grass greener on the other side? Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. So it's either you are you feel like you're actually missing something in your relationship or you are just curious about the outside, which happens to many people in relationships. You are very young, I will say that. So I can't tell you to leave this partner because I'm not you. You're the one who's going to wake up every single day being in a relationship that you're not happy with, or you're going to wake up every single day being single and regretting that you let go of the best person in the world. I don't know, but I will say this. Don't stay out of comfort because not only is it not fair to you, it's not fair to this person that you're saying how much you love them. I know personally, and anyone else I know, they wouldn't wanna be with someone that didn't actually want to be there 100%. That sucks. That person, your boyfriend, deserves someone who's as invested and loves them just as much as they love you. Again, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know what's actually happening in your relationship. So I don't know what you guys have gone through, but give it some time, clear your head, maybe even take a break with them and see how you really feel. Feel your emotions, see if you miss him, see if those feelings are not going away, then have a conversation with your partner. Maybe they're on the same page as you. Maybe he'll agree to take a break with you. But I can't tell you to break up with someone because if you're willing to lose someone, then you do deserve to lose them and they deserve to find someone better. And the whole thing of the right person, wrong time, I don't believe in it. I think people come into your life exactly when they're supposed to. So they're either lessons or the love of your life. And most people are lessons and that's okay. So don't drag this on longer than it should be. If you had two amazing years and now you have outgrown this relationship because from 20 to 25, your frontal lobe is constantly evolving. 
So you are becoming a different person every single year. So it makes sense for you to feel like you've outgrown this relationship at 25. It makes sense that you're curious. Me personally, I wish I didn't stay in my relationship for eight years with my ex in my 20s. I wish I left sooner. So do what you will with this information. And I wish you nothing but the best. Kendall asked me, how the fuck do I get him out of my mind? I need to get him out of my head right now. Well, Kendall, just listen to my episode from two weeks ago, how to detach in 24 hours, and it will help you. But I'll just give you a little cliff notes. You basically use the law of detachment. And the law of detachment is you take the energy you've been putting on everyone else and you rechange it onto yourself. And there's a few steps on the episode on how to do that. But right now, this man is never coming your way as long as you're this obsessive over him and you're thinking about him every second. Your energy is reeking of desperation. And that is why he's nowhere near you. Rosa said, he said he doesn't feel a spark, but he wants to keep dating. I like him so much and he treats me so well. Rosa, I wish I was as delusional as you because how the F did you put that in the same sentence? He treats me so well. He said he doesn't see a spark, but he wants to keep dating. Girl, he doesn't like you. Sometimes I think we mix he treats me so well, but with like a guy doing the bare minimum, like answering your phone calls, responding to your texts in like a timely manner, hanging out with you once every week or two weeks. And we're like, oh my God, he's so good to me because he's like responsive. (laughs) If someone says they don't feel a spark, then you know what you need to do? Make them feel a spark. How will he feel a spark? Ding, ding, ding. Listen to my episode from three weeks ago called How Men Fall in Love, A Step-by-Step Guide. In that episode, I explained to you the different hormones that men have and how to trigger their specific monogamy hormones and their other hormones that make them fall in love with you. So if he doesn't feel a spark, then guess what? You need to stress him out, aka you need to trigger his stress hormones. That is what makes a man feel like there's a spark. A lot of the time, there is no spark. The woman is just a little unavailable. And suddenly they're like, there's so much chemistry. I'm just so turned on. I'm so into her because she's not always there. And I can tell, big Rosa, you're probably always there. So how the F can this man miss you? If you are just always waiting around and are so available, a man tells you there's no spark and you say, okay, can I suck your dick now? No, there's no spark. Okay, then I don't have time for this. Take a step back, focus on yourself. Listen to my episode, How Men Fall in Love from three weeks ago and take back your power and create that spark. There's still a chance for you to make him fall in love with you, but you have to listen to my episode from three weeks ago. Megan said, I don't think I've ever felt less love in a relationship, but the thought of ending it kills me. Megan, I know that breaking up will be painful. I can't tell you that it won't be. It will be. And you're going to need time to heal and detach from being in a couple and being with someone that feels familiar and having a routine. But I will tell you that eventually you will be okay again and you will be happy again. But if you stay in a relationship where you feel unloved, It will constantly validate how you feel about yourself deep down. It will constantly bring you down and you will knock yourself so down, so low that when this man finally leaves you, you you'll be left with nothing, no purpose, no identity. You will be so lost because you poured everything into someone, into a relationship that wasn't for you. And that will be the hardest lesson you will have to learn. I hope you will not wait until that moment to learn that lesson. I hope you will do the hard thing right now and leave. Because trust me, it's gonna be so much harder for you to get back up if you get to that point versus if you left now and healed yourself faster and sooner. Don't stay where you are not wanted. Don't stay where you are not loved. Trust me, it's better to be alone than with the wrong person, than with someone who's wasting your time. The worst part is that when you stay in a relationship that's not right for you, you are keeping the doors closed to other opportunities. Your energy is so closed off without you even realizing. So I hope that helps. Okay, I think that is all for today's Benson Knows Best. It was just quick to the point. I hope you loved my little advice. If you enjoyed today's episode, don't forget to subscribe, share with your friends, rate me five stars on the Apple Podcast app. It helps my podcast tremendously. I read all the reviews and it keeps me in the charts because then it allows me to continue producing these 
awesome episodes that I pour my heart into. Thank you so much for listening and I'll see you next week. Я вас люблю. До свидания.